So, thank you very much, everybody, for waiting. Uh, our next speaker is Christoph Tott. Uh, we'll speak about containerizing IT security knowledge. All right. Thank you, guys. So today I will be talking about containers and IT security. If I could see my slides. All right, awesome. So uh, basically, since you are all here, we know that something is wrong with security, I guess. Like all these vulnerabilities going around, trouble, breaches, data getting stalled, CI-CD pipelines implemented in the wrong way, DevSecOps, everything. So what could we do about this whole thing and why do these things happen? Because like, it seems so that the whole industry is like standing around like this, like it's fine, it's all right, this is the way things should be. And nothing really, nobody really feels responsible for these things. So isn't it time to like just take a hold of ourselves and do something about it? Uh, so why are we failing? Why is this the case? And I think that the problem starts with the amount of programmers, like it's growing really rapidly. It actually doubles every few years. This is a trend that is slowing down actually, but it's still pretty strong. And if you think about it, this means that basically in every given point of time, around half of the developers are juniors. So like they are beginners and how they get security right? I mean, IT sec training is still a curiosity at most universities. We don't really, for example, I finished at the Budapest University of Economics and Technology and it was like a single course we had in IT security, which was mandatory and that's all. Like, how would you educate your software developers to be conscious about security if that's the case? It's just impossible. And basically what's happening is we have a whole lot of engineers without proper background in security, nothing whatsoever. So it's not really good and I think that we should do something about that. And it's great that we are here at this conference because, I mean, we know there's something wrong at, and we are willing to do something about it. but we need to get the word out to everybody else so like people start to take security seriously and it's really everybody's job so there's no question about that and from my point of view i really feel like the missing link is education so like we have really good tools and we have lectures and great talks and conferences but it's just not accessible for any, anybody like if you go to a university, you will probably have one or two IT security classes and that's all. But if you are learning to code from a coding academy or on your own or something, then you just won't meet security until there, are, there is trouble. Uh, so at our company, Avato, I am a software engineer and we've been working on a bit of a framework which helps you to create these interactive containers. Uh, what is it? Uh, basically, it helps you create interactive tutorials which will guide users uh, through a set of problems uh, and it does that automatically so you won't have to be standing there and do your thing. Uh, it also interacts with itself so basically you take your users and sit them down in front of one of our containers and it will guide them through a set of exercises or problems. For example, if I created a website and it was vulnerable against SQL injection, then we would instruct the user to attack that website and tell them how SQL injection works, for instance. And after he has exploited that vulnerability, then we would pop up a code editor and something and explain to him or her how to fix it in real life. And what's fun about it is that's essentially a hybrid of classic hacking labs and training videos. So in order to start doing a CTF or something, you need some knowledge previously. So like you have to know some hacking basically. But in this case, you don't need to do that. So you can just pick it up and it will explain to you what to do. And we expose the whole thing through a browser. So basically it's just a browser tab and you can open it and it will show you some software and you can hack it and fix it afterwards. And the fun thing about it is, it, it, it's we just put it in regular Docker containers and you can ship it and run them. It's standard containers, nothing fancy about it. All open technologies. So basically it's hacking labs on crack, if you will. 
so now I would like to show you a bit of a demo on how this works. It's just, I don't know, like a five minutes demo on a container like this, so you can imagine better, because it's one thing to talk about it and another one to see how it works in real life. So give me a moment to open up our stuff, all right. So as you can see, this is the platform of our company. Uh, we basically run Docker containers. So when I click this Start Now button, it will just spin up a container for you. And once I open it, you will see that here on the left side, we have this little chatbot, and it is explaining to you the steps you have to take to complete the challenge right there. In the middle, we have this whole web service thingy. It's just a regular website and it's exposed to our framework. Basically, this is a tutorial on direct object reference. So the chatbot is explaining to you the steps. I will just go through it quickly. Basically, what you have to do is just log into this web service. Uh, notice that this is a real web server running. It's, I don't know, it's written in, I think it's Python. So it's just running. Uh, and basically, what I have to do is see what users are online, and I can browse them and I can see their profi profiles as well. And as you know, direct object reference works like just changing some references and trying to access an endpoint which is not properly authenticated. And I am able to access the profile of this hacker by just editing the, the URL. And this is not good. And as you may have already noticed, we have popped up this code editor and it will allow you to fix the bug. And basically the chatbot is doing its job and explaining to you what to do, but the part is that you have to implement this little authorized user function and deal with the authorization logic properly. Uh, it's fun because this is a real code editor, so it's actually called the Monaco editor, which is used by Visual Studio Code. And if I do something wrong and try to deploy it, you will be able to see that we got real track traces, so I'm really trying to run this piece of code which you're writing. So this is not a mock-up, it's, it's the real software. And if I fix it, it should be able to deploy. Yep, as you can see, it's just a Flask server and it's putting out the output of it. And I will implement this little function by checking if the current user is the one I want to try it and deploy it. As you can see, the framework has detected that the solution was correct, and right now it just continues along with the exercise. So basically what we do is we usually run a set of unit tests against your code to check if it's correct or not, but you could theoretically write any logic to validate logic, so the framework is flexible in that manner. And now if I try to log in again and see if my little direct object reference still works, I will find that the bug has been fixed. So I wouldn't be able to access that. Yeah, it's an authorization error. And basically, we have this little state machine, which is tracking the user's progress. And right now, if I go back to the platform and check the solution, it will tell me that I have solved this challenge and it's awesome. Uh, yeah, so basically, this is how it works. What we are doing now is we have open source this whole framework, which allows you to create challenges like this. Uh, so, where was I? Yup. Yeah. So, we had our demo, and now, what's the value of this? So, why would anybody want to use this? Why is this good? Uh, basically, this is a smart security sandbox, so you have your basic hacking lab, and it's smart, so it tries to detect what you're doing, and tries to guide you into the right direction. Uh, it's... The value is, as I have previously explained, you don't need any learning curve to do this. For example, if I were to organize a CTF at my company, I would require to give some sort of training to the developers so that they can pick it up and hack. But this is not the case with these tutorials because anybody could just open, up on, open them up on a browser tab and start playing around with them because the bot would explain to you what to do from the, from the scratch. Uh, it's also real software running in these containers, so we don't have to emulate anything. Anything that you can run in a regular Docker container, you can run in this framework. This is really flexible. And it's also like 
hands-on and self-guided, so you don't have to have a trainer explaining the steps to the users, they can just do it on their own. And I think that's a great thing because, for example, if I were a professor at a university or something, teaching IT security or just coding in general, I could create a lab such as this for my students and give it out to them so that they can play around on their own and learn something useful. It's even good for like homework assignment, but still it's fun. Like every time I felt like I learned something new and valuable, it was by experimenting with something on my own. So it's one thing to read something about uh, software in a textbook or programming in general, and it's a completely other thing to play around with it in real life. Uh, another thing is that it's for you. Basically, anybody can use it. It's really good for trainers, teachers, security people. We are trying to get this whole framework out to the whole community so that anybody can use it. Uh, it's good because it's fast and easy to develop. If you know container technology, you should, be, you should feel right at home. It's not hard to put together a challenge like the one I have shown you before. It's just a few hours of coding. Uh, it's also free and open source, basically. No proprietary technology involved. It's Docker, containers, our part of the framework, which is the front end and the back end, which I will explain in detail a bit later, is open source as well. And basically, you can run the whole thing locally. So the demo I have shown you was running on our platform, but that's not required. <laughs> This whole product is completely independent of our platform and you can run it locally, ship it anywhere, it's just containers, so nothing fancy. Uh, what do you get with all this? Basically what the framework gives you is a set of components. Uh, as you have seen, it's pretty smart in telling what the user is doing, so offering help based on the context and things like that, popping up the code editor when it's needed. Uh, we use a state machine for that of some sort. Uh, we provide you an IDE in the browser, a console and a terminal for your regular developer needs to write code or, I don't know, display the results of unit tests or anything. Uh, we also give you this little chat component you have seen on the left so that you can actually instruct the user if it's required. Uh, you get process management, live logs from the whole container and lots of more of stuff. It's uh, pretty flexible in terms of what you can do with it and you can always pick and choose the things you would like. How does it work? So it, the demo was, a, I think that it was pretty, like it was good in the terms that you could see what's really happening, but how we implement all this. Basically what we have is a set of processes running in a Docker container. We use the init system called Tini to do this with Supervisor D, which is just a supervisor for processes. Uh, we need an init system to avoid zombie processes and stuff, but it doesn't really matter, it works fine. Uh, another thing is that we have an Nginx server serving the front end, which is written in Angular, it's a single page application. Uh, and we have this communication daemon running in the background of the container, which is like the whole heart of the thing, basically. It talks with the front end, it talks with the process, it sends messages. You can instrument the framework to do things with this daemon. Uh, it's used for RPC and event advertisement, and it works over 0MQ. So if you want to talk to the framework, you would basically connect to a 0MQ socket and send some sort of messages to it. Uh, it connects to the front end via web sockets, and the thing about it is that the whole front end is hidden from you, so you don't have to deal with it. It's com it comes for free. So you only have to talk to the processes and our daemon, and we will deal with the front end as we have to. So you don't have to touch it, basically. You don't have to write JavaScript if you don't want to. You can, but you don't have to. Uh, how does this whole like message broker daemon thingy work? It's, it uses a simple JSON-based message format. So basically what happens is that uh, we wanted, it, wanted to keep it simple, so we could have went from something like DBus or RabbitMQ or some sort of existing message broker, but we felt like uh, it would be too much of a learning curve. We needed something really simple, which can be used for instrumenting our framework and event advertisement. And what we did was implement our own and use a simple JSON-based message, message format, basically. Uh, as I have mentioned, we are using this for remote procedural calls, so like for example writing to the IDE, I can 
override the text that's there or write to the console, enter a command to the terminal, switch the layouts. These are all like control events. Uh, it's also used for event advertisements. So for instance, uh, if somebody entered anything into the IDE, I would be able to write a process which would be able to detect that. So like he doesn't have to save the file or anything. I can just track it real time what the user is doing. Uh, this whole daemon thingy, it uh, routes messages between 0MQ and the WebSockets. So basically what we did is connect the front-end component to an IPC mechanism. And that's what allows us to do this whole interactive container thing. Basically, we have implemented something that's, uh, that's useful for keeping live things in a website, so like WebSockets. Uh, before WebSockets, we could have used uh, some sort of long polling, but WebSockets is just better bidirectional content. Uh, processes are connecting to it over 0MQ. Uh, it uses the publish socket and the pull socket. I will show an architecture diagram later. And for ease of use, we have also implemented a little component which allows you to communicate with the daemon over regular named pipes. So like, Stood in and stood out would be name pipes, and you could just write a line of JSON to it and tell it to do something. Uh, yep. Here is the architectural diagram. Basically, how it works is we have this whole routing solution in the middle, and we separate the whole thing here. Like, this is the front end, you don't have to deal with it. We talk to it over WebSockets, and then we have our internal handlers. These are processes which are able to communicate with the framework. Uh, we have some built-ins like the ID or the terminal or the FSM, the state machine, and you can also implement your own if you want it to. And basically this allows you to communicate with the framework, respond to events and do anything you want to. It's quite flexible in that regard. And you could also use our messaging broker to create your own messages and talk to your own components, you can get pretty fancy with it if you want it to. Uh, how do you use it? So what's, what's it all about? Uh, basically, our components are using this daemon to communicate. So they are sending messages and instrumenting each other, talking to each other. Uh, you can control them with the JSON API and they also broadcast relevant events. So for instance, if the user entered something to the terminal, I would be able to respond to that. So let's say that the user has listed all the files in the current directory, then I would be able to, I don't know, write a message to him that good luck next time you should list the other directory or something like that. Uh, basically what you would do to implement a tutorial, as I have shown you before, is just fill up a container with the software you need. So install a web server in it. For example, if you use Java, you could implement a web server in Spring and put it into the container, run it and you would be able to expose it through our front end and then you could instrument the framework to deal with the user interactivity stuff. So for instance, uh, you could implement your web server as such that if somebody managed to uh, exploit it and hack it, then it would tell the framework that that happened and then you could step into the next step or pop up a code editor so that the user could fix the code. It's really flexible. Uh, now I've been talking about how this whole thing, this whole thing works and like what it does and why, but I would like to show to you how it really does it. Uh, I will do this again like an interactive demo style of thingy where I will just start up it on my own machine locally and see what it does. Uh, let's start it up. This is just a script which is calling Docker internally. This is also part of the whole framework. And as you can see, we have the output of the framework here, basically. It's just a simple Docker container. And after it has started successfully, I will be able to just open it up and see what it does. So as you can see, this is just a mock-up exercise. It doesn't really do anything. But here we have a Python web server, and we have the code for it here in the right. Uh, you have the messaging bot you have seen and the simple terminal. So let's see what I can do with it. Uh, one part of the interactivity we have implemented is, for example, if I created a new file, like let's say touch some file, uh, 
then you will be able to see that the ID has picked up on it, that there's a new file in the current working directory and has displayed it in a new tab, and I can select it afterwards. Basically, we use Enotify to do this from the Linux kernel, and we, we, we just uh, combined it with our messaging daemon, and we are sending messages to tell the ID that there's a new file and we should display a new tab. Uh, if I were to write something to the file, you can see that it, it picks up on that also. So like it's completely interactive and it does it real time. Like you can see that I'm writing to it right now. I could even do something like uh, write a script, like write to do sleep one and echo something the file and done and right now this will just keep on writing to the file something so it's just really interactive and works really of course this works the other way around so if I were to display the contents of the file I'm also able to write to the ID and you can see that it's filling up live these interactivity thing is are provided by the framework for free so you don't have to do anything to be able to do this it's just if you use our id it just does these things uh, yep another thing you can do is you can write to this messaging component to tell the user what to do basically how we expose our api is to zero mq sockets but it would be really hard for me to show, show that through a terminal so i have to come up with something else uh, I have mentioned previously that we expose our API through named pipes as well. So what I'm able to do is just create a named pipe. And we have this directory in the run folder. Uh, and any pipe you create there, the framework will detect it and connect to it. And afterwards, you will be able to use that pipe to communicate with the framework, read and send messages to it. So I will create a send pipe, for instance. Uh, and in this case, I will be able to just send comments to that pipe if everything went correctly. Uh, let's see. Yep, we have our pipe right there. And let's try writing something to it to see what happens. So I will just say run, we send. And as I have mentioned previously, we use JSON to communicate because it's just plain simple. You don't have to think about anything. Uh, our framework uses a special format of JSON for addressing. The key key is to tell where to send the message, basically. And we have this whole remote procedural core mechanism which enables us to, s to tell what to do. So for instance, I would be able to say message.send and message would be, I don't know, something. And in this case, you can see that here is the message I have just sent. Uh, <laughs> this little thingy is just John Cena stuff is just a fun way to show that uh, if I enter something to the terminal I can detect that and do something to it so for instance uh, if I told a user to delete the directory then I would monitor the terminal so if he entered a command which would delete the directory I would check if the directory exists and tell him that it was the correct solution uh, so something like that for instance uh, yeah as you can see, we have this web service here, which I have mentioned, and basically the source code of it is on the left here, on the right side here. So it's the real code running. For instance, if I was to, I don't know, write something which is not correct Python, so that won't work, the interpreter will fail on it, and try to deploy it, it will tell me that it didn't work and I should try something else. And afterwards, I would be able to see the whole stack trace in the console, so it's just the real software running. Uh, another thing is that these logs are completely live. So if I were to fix my code and start clicking around on the website, then you can see that the logs are coming in live. So if I click something, then it will just tell me that it has sent a request to the server. And this works with anything. So you could implement this in Java, .NET, any language you want to. The only thing you have to do is run it to supervisor and tell the framework which process you are interested in, and it will be able to, to read the logs of the process, basically. Uh, to, like, 
to prove that this is real code running, for example, we have this authenticate function here. Basically, all it does is uh, try to read the user from the database and validate if it's correct. Uh, and it raises an invalidate creden invalid credentials error if it's not. So what I will do is just tell it to return instead of doing that. And basically what I did with this is now I can log in with any user. So I can just, or I have did something wrong, but yup, there's a pipe deleted, it won't work. But as you can see, I'm not really good at live demos, but the framework will tell me what I did wrong. So there is a permission error. I'm trying to open a pipe, which is not available right now. Uh, so yeah, this is like real code running. And the fun thing about it is you can do this with any language, really. So like you could just write a bus script or something and tell people what to do with it. Uh, yep. All right. Let's see what else we can do. Uh, I have mentioned that the framework raises events of interesting, ev interesting things that happened while the user is doing his stuff. And for instance, I would be able to create a script called notify here. And let's write a bash script to detect what the user has written to the IDE, for instance. So in the beginning, I would create two pipes to communicate with the framework. I would create this pipe, and I would create another one to receive messages as well. There's nothing magical to these pipes, so these are just regular named pipes. Like, you could create them from any language or any way you would like to. And afterwards, I could set up a while loop in which I would read the messages. So this is just a bash way to read a line from a file, basically. It's nothing else. Read a line, do something, done. Basically, I will just display the message for now, and let's see what happens. Uh, this is how I can read a line from, from a file in bash. Run, all right, so see what happens if I execute this script. As you can see, there's an error because the file already exists, but there's no issue. And if I am switching tabs, you can see that there are events being raised because I have switched tabs. And basically what you would be able to do from your own components is detect that uh, somebody has switched files on the ID and do something based on that. Uh, or for instance, uh, if I was to, I don't know, send some other, like I clicked on the web service and I'm getting the live logs, like just printed out. These are basically the logs that are produced by the process. Uh, and in the console, it's displayed nicely, of course, but this is just the dump of a JSON whole thingy. So it's not very nice. Okay, so what can I do with this? For instance, I could do something like, uh, detect if somebody has written something to the IDE. So I would tell it that if the line, let's say that the line contains something like, I don't know, cat, then I would just, just, I don't know, echo something and see what happens. So in this case, if I run this script, you can see that it has printed it out several times already. That's because that the file contains that string itself. But if I was to switch to this other file, which doesn't contain it, then you can see that I'm writing, 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 and nothing happens. And if I write cat, then the terminal would start going down because that's the event I'm interested in. And you could do anything with this. So basically, you could compile and run the code and see if it's correct, or I don't know, you could ask the user to enter some sort of specific command into your file and do that as well. So it's really interactive and you can do anything with it. All right. Another thing about the whole framework is that, uh, as you can see, we have these little layouts on the side. So 
you can switch between them dynamically during the tutorial and just show up the components you really need. So there are challenges where you don't need a web service, for instance, then you could just hide it away and just display the ID and the terminal and stuff. Uh, our API also allows you to switch layouts dynamically. So you would be able to do something like, uh, I don't know, this is the correct API message for doing something like this. Let's say frontend dot dashboard dashboard and let's say that I would like to change the layout to something like I don't know terminal only all our layouts have these names and these are documented in our API documentation so now that I send this message messages that switch the layout to the terminal only layout and you could create your own commands as well and deal with them as you would like to Another thing that you can do is that, for instance, we have this little web service here. You could display uh, an URL bar for it, for instance. So if I were to say, let's say that show URL bar and tell it true, then it would display the URL bar. And in this case, I would be able to navigate with it or do anything with it I would like to. I could also like, switch the URL of the iframe from the API, I could reload the whole website, I could do anything to it. And it's really exp expansible as well, so if you would like to add any capability to the framework, you are able to do so since it's open source. Uh, and you can do it for anything, you can use it for anything you would like to. So yeah, uh, basically that's how the framework works and operates. and. I guess that based on this little demonstration, you would be able to imagine things to do with it. So for the purposes of education, you could, I don't know, uh, educate your users to how to set up a cluster of services or whatever. It's really flexible and this is just standard containers, so you are able to run any code in it you would like to. Okay, so let's go back to the slides. Yep. Uh, and how is the licensing and how are we open sourcing this thing? So basically we would like to give back to the community and if you would like to use this framework you can for any purpose basically. It's licensed under the lesser uh, GPL so basically you can do anything you, you want to do with it. It's really permissive. It's free as in freedom. It's Stallman approved and everything and it's available on GitHub as well. So you can just go on there and, I don't know, hit up a pull request and do something to it. So if this is something that you have liked, then please, please feel free to contribute and give back also. You can just download it, play around with it. And if you don't like it, then throw it away. But if you like it, then you can contribute or create challenges you want to. Uh, I think that basically if you want to give training to anybody, this is something that's really nice to use. So you just put together a few software examples into a container and use it. And as I have told you, this is completely independent of our company. So you can run it locally, run it on a server, run it anywhere. So it's, it's completely free. It's, we, you are not depending on anybody else, just the code. And yeah, basically that's it. It's available on GitHub, as I have said, check it out. Uh, I feel like this is something really trendy to do to open source things nowadays, but it's also something really useful because we can learn from each other a lot. So for instance, if you didn't like something about the demo, then you could just go up on GitHub, read the code and change it and send me a pull request and it might be great. So I think that basically that's all. So. Thank you for listening and please feel free to shoot any questions if you have them. Yep. Mm, that's a good question. What you can do is pass uh, the Docker Unix domain socket as a volume and then you would be able to call it from a container. It's a mess, I know. It doesn't sound good. I wouldn't do it, but you can do it if you want to. Uh, basically, what you could do is uh, like instrumenting the Docker daemon your container is running from is not really advisable 
but if you were to run separate instances of Docker, then you could, I don't know, run them in a VM and pass that socket in. So it's possible to do. But even the Docker team wouldn't advise you to run Docker in Docker. They only use it for developing Docker itself. So you can do it, but I would advise against it, basically. Any other questions? Yep. Basically, we are just using Docker. So it's using namespaces from the kernel, but we are not touching it in any way whatsoever. So these are like standard compliant containers. You could run them with Podman or something else, not just Docker. So uh, our tooling is dependent on Docker. So for example, our scripts are calling Docker, build Docker, run Docker, whatever. Uh, but if you were to build an image, then you could run it with any other tooling as you would like to. So it's just a root fresh at that point. Anything else? Yep. Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, sure. It would work with any process. So how it works internally is I have mentioned that we use the process management system called supervisor to run processes in the container. And basically what the supervisor thing allows you to do is it allows you to tell which file the process is writing its logs to. And what our framework does, it takes that file and subscribes in Notify events to it. So the kernel would tell me when anything happened to that file, and then I would read it and send it to the front end. So that's how it works. So it's completely generic. You could use it for any language whatsoever, which is capable of logging to a file. So yeah, that's how it works. Awesome. Any other questions? All right, great. So thank you, guys. Thank you. And uh, we've got a few minutes till lunch, so uh, got about seven minutes or so. So I would recommend getting your last final stamps on your vendor passports and uh, posting those passports in the reception, reception, registration when you've done that. And then uh, lunch will be in the main room in uh, about six, seven minutes or so. <laughs>